York City. Population, seven and a half million. These people exist mere minutes by missile from any point on Earth. Chicago, four million Americans within missile range of potential enemies. Los Angeles, two and a half million Americans less than 30 minutes from unfriendly missile bases. Every man, woman, and child in every city, town, and village in our nation lives this very moment in the shadow of war. Lamona, Washington, population 31. Above it, in a dusty, sun-baked wheat field, the sounds of defense, of national survival. The sounds are the labors of men forging a missile launching site. They're digging into this American Earth, a defensive emplacement with the same life or death significance as those at Bunker Hill, Gettysburg, Below Wood, Normandy, or the Chosin Reservoir. A program to build a battle line of combat-ready missile sites throughout the nation in a race against time. As fast as brain and brawn, ingenuity, and a sense of national self-preservation can accomplish the Herculean task. Nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles will soon be poised here and in other strategic locations across America. Teamed with shorter-range missiles in Europe and aboard our submarines at sea, they will stand as silent sentinels enforcing the armed peace. Peace enforcement demands an arsenal so lethal that it hovers the threat of destruction over potential war makers. And the new bulwark of all major arsenals is the ballistic missile. Overnight, the ballistic missile dwarfed the world, revolutionized warfare. It shattered our former protective barriers of time and distance. It threatened to bring irresistible firepower against any target on Earth in minutes instead of hours or days. Suddenly, to maintain our deterrent strength, we needed a missile strike force. Now, to build that strike force, government and industry and labor have united in a titanic effort, unmatched in urgency, overshadowed in scope only by World War II. Driven by the relentless whiplash of time, the Air Force devised a development concept termed concurrency. It means we gambled on telescoping design, test, and production phases of missile system development until they were occurring nearly simultaneously. We won the gamble. Concurrency shaved nearly three years off the development time for Atlas, our first long-range missile. Now being deployed across the nation, Atlas can hurtle a hydrogen warhead 9,000 miles with devastating accuracy. When we started the missile program those few short years ago, national security could not be dependent on the then unproven Atlas alone. So we ordered a backup ICBM, the Titan, and we reaped a double bonus when both giants proved their military worth. Both of the liquid fuel weapons packed crushing, high-yield nuclear punches capable of destroying heavily shielded targets. They're the juggernauts the heavyweights of our missile strike. But we needed a hard, straight left-hand jab, too. We needed large quantities of a low-cost weapon to rain destruction against hundreds of strategic targets simultaneously. We needed Minuteman. Designed for intercontinental ranges, Minuteman uses solid propellant, eliminating the complex plumbing systems required for the liquid fuel missile. It's an uncomplicated, easily mass-produced weapon which can be launched in seconds with a nuclear payload. Here at Cape Canaveral and at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the big missiles encounter their supreme test, flight. Each flight is monumentally important. Missiles are expensive and only a relatively few are test flown. So every possible bit of performance data is obtained to confirm system worthiness and to be used for design improvement. On this maiden flight, Minuteman streaked to intercontinental distance objectives, logging a dramatic milestone in its race to battle readiness. But even as Minuteman demonstrated its potential, 
Advanced versions of the mighty liquid missiles continued flight testing to perfect performance, to increase effectiveness. A new model, Atlas, ready for flight, towers eight stories high, weighs over a quarter of a million pounds, thunders aloft on thrust equivalent to three and a half million horsepower. Like all missiles, this weapon's sole purpose is to propel a warhead to a predetermined point in the sky. It then falls free, leaving the payload to arc alone through the fringes of space at 15,000 miles per hour toward its target. The giant Titan stands nearly 100 feet tall, scales well over 100 tons at flight time. Advanced models are powered by storable liquid propellant. This increases effectiveness by permitting a long-duration storage in a fueled, launch-ready state. The weapon is thus primed to respond instantly if needed for battle. A ballistic missile is just one part of a total weapon system. By itself, it is not comparable to a supersonic bomber, though both are designed to deliver nuclear bombs. The bomber is a complete, self-contained weapon system. Within its fuselage are the men to fly and guide it, the electronic and mechanical systems needed to fulfill its mission. The missile depends on ground-based equipment to perform many of the vital functions which occur in the aircraft. It needs a launching site with crews and equipment to service it, feed it target information, and to launch it. Building the complexes, the weapons to fire the missiles, is an undertaking equal to building the missiles themselves. Bombers fly from existing airfields, but missiles must stand where nothing existed before. So we must gouge the earth for new emplacements and shield them with tons of steel and concrete and cram them with delicate electronics and rugged launch machinery. We must direct this battle line of nuclear-age bastions from the coast of California to upstate New York, from Washington State to Abilene, Texas. And we must have it bristling with war-ready missiles in the early 1960s. As always, time is our taskmaster. The sweep of the second hand governed our planning, ruled that we should commence design and construction of the launching sites even before the missiles had proven themselves in flight. And it dictated that we should prepare this battle line with tactics similar to those of an army digging defensive positions. First, we constructed unprotected launches to provide a small force of operational missiles as fast as possible. Under that preliminary screen, we began lightly shielded emplacements called soft sites. Above ground, relatively fast to build, they offer some protection to missile and crew. As the defense screen grew stronger, we invested additional precious time to construct more rugged launches called semi-hardened sites. These emplacements shield weapon, crew, and vital equipment below ground level, covered by cement, and dirt. Our strongest stations are the silos. Plunged deep into the bowels of the earth, they afford maximum protection from nuclear attack. But they're the toughest to build, so they're the last to join the battle line. Squadrons of all three of our long-range missiles will be housed in silos. Rugged and widely dispersed, these underground fortresses are designed to survive attack to reel with an enemy's nuclear blows and then to unleash our missile strike force in retaliation. Building the battle line on schedule is a job staggering in scope and complexity. But even with its critical deadlines and brutal problems of supply and planning, the mammoth undertaking is constantly gaining momentum. It's being accomplished by the strength and genius of tens of thousands of our countrymen. A skilled team of men and women, military and civilian, representing nearly every occupation. Specialists ranging from construction tradesmen to missile technicians have converged on remote locations across the land to build the needed complex. Labor unions assemble skilled workforces to meet project demands in low manpower regions, and industries sent in their key personnel. The job is rugged. It means working despite the moods of weather, under withering earth-parching suns that scorch steel to frying temperatures, 
and in torturing, body-stinging cold that freezes less vital construction projects to a standstill. It means working on desolate plains and seldom-seen farm fields, removed from many taken-for-granted conveniences. And building the complexes is a new, exacting science. It requires construction tradesmen to work to tolerances found in aircraft plants, to the cleanliness standards of operating rooms. Men who mastered their crafts on bridges and buildings now build structures rugged enough to survive nuclear blasts, complex enough to service and launch giant missiles. They must now align building foundations with precision demanded of machinists. They must install miles of electrical wiring with the knowledge that one faulty circuit will knock a missile out of action as effectively as a bomb. They must assemble plumbing systems for the liquid missiles with a hospital's concern for cleanliness, knowing that one speck of dirt could cause a damaging explosion when gelled with liquid oxygen. And constantly emphasized in each of the thousands of construction and installation steps is the necessity of planning, coordination, teamwork. A launcher must be delivered and installed on schedule so it will be ready to receive the next section of equipment when it arrives. The part manufactured in Phoenix, Arizona must align perfectly in the fields near Salina, Kansas with another part produced in San Diego. Changes in the design of one part must be incorporated into the design of its counterpart before the two meet at a missile site. All phases of a site's development, from construction to test, are conducted under the vigil of Air Force officers. They are members of a specially selected activation task force, charged with the responsibility of completing the battle line on schedule. Like the missile, the launch complex is subjected to intensive testing throughout the activation cycle. Each piece of equipment is tested individually and again when it's mated to a system. Finally, a missile is moved to launch emplacement. Here again, government, industry, and labor unite to complete a weapon system. But the system is still not operational. It must first demonstrate that the missile and support equipment function together as planned. The tests are vital to ensure battle readiness, since the missile will never fly except in war. Faults, if they exist, are isolated and repaired and the testing continues until the weapon system is operationally perfect. Then, and only then, is the missile ready for a hydrogen warhead, packing more destruction than all the bombs dropped by all the combatants in World War II. Only then is it ready to assume its station on the nation's battle line. An isolated plane in Wyoming population, a strategic air command crew, and one more intercontinental ballistic missile, capable of striking an enemy in minutes. Another sentry on the battle line, enforcing the armed peace.